afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on our panel today to discuss the legislative impact on innovation and entrepreneurship. My name is Shelley Kapoor Collins, and I have the pleasure of moderating today's discussion. Technology is fast outpacing state and federal regulations, and issues stemming from the innovation economy more and more do not fit within the parameters of existing laws and policies. Issues especially of importance to the tech community, such as net neutrality, which has been in the news quite a bit, Bitcoin, clean energy, patent reform, and emerging markets, such as the sharing economy, have created a need for Silicon Valley to sit up and take notice of Washington and state capitals. The old mentality of tech CEOs and entrepreneurs that government is not their problem has become a thing of the past, and it's clear that innovators and regulators do need to work together. The broader question we are here to answer today is how can regulators and industry work together to promote innovation, which really goes to the heart of our global competitiveness? To help us answer this question and address some of the key issues which I just mentioned, we are lucky to have our panelists here today joining us, including two high-level officials from the Obama administration and a senior executive from industry representing the sharing economy. We have, starting at the end, Mr. John Kabeka, director of the U.S. Patent Trade Office here in Silicon Valley and opening up later in the year, Travis LeBlanc, chief of the Enforcement Bureau at the FCC, and Joe Opaku, Director of Public Policy for the ride-sharing uh, ride company, Lyft. So please welcome my panelists, and with that, I would like each of them to introduce themselves and give us a bit about their organization and their role in the organization, starting with John. <laughs> All right, thank you, Shelley. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is John Kabeka. I've been at the Patent and Trademark Office for over 25 years. And uh, when, I, when I say that to anyone from the Silicon Valley, they kind of look at me, because usually you know, there's quite a pervasive culture in the Silicon Valley of changing jobs every few years. But even though I've been at the agency that long, I've actually wore many hats over the course of my career. Uh, not only as, was starting as a patent examiner and a supervisor and a director of one of the technology centers, but also uh, having the opportunity to serve on detail at the White House and uh, most recently serving as a chief advisor to the Undersecretary of Commerce for Intellectual Property, the head of the USPTO, uh, prior to coming to the Silicon Valley to, to lead up our regional, uh, our regional office here in San Jose, which will be opening later this year. Uh, just very excited about the opportunities that will be uh, once we open our space in the Silicon Valley, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Great, thank you. And Travis? Hi, thank you very much, Shelley. It's an honor to be here uh, and join my fellow panelists, uh, John and Joseph. Um, my name is Travis Blanc. I am the Chief of Enforcement at the Federal Communications Commission. Uh, I've been there just over a year now. I was previously in California working for the Attorney General Kamala Harris. Um, the Federal Communications Commission uh, enforces and regulates um, all of the communications industries. Generally speaking, that's television, radio, telephone, cable, satellite, and uh, now um, broadband internet service. Um, we in the Enforcement Bureau enforce all of the communications laws and the regulations of the Commission in those various industries. We have 24 offices around the country, including one here in, uh, in the Bay Area over in the East Bay. Um, and we've been working hard to ensure that our enforcement of uh, the various laws uh, are protecting consumers, are safeguarding competition, are securing uh, communications networks, and are policing the activities and programs that we enforce at the FCC. Uh, given the very nature of the technologies that we deal with and how quickly they are changing, we're constantly trying to make sure that our enforcement activities, our regulations are evolving with the technology and that we're really working on the issues that matter most to Americans, and in particular American consumers in the 21st century, as well as the businesses that rely upon those communications networks. So I'm delighted to be here today and certainly look forward to the continued conversation. Thank you so much, Travis. Really appreciate that background and look forward to talking to you more. And Joe, please. Thank you, Shelley. Uh, my name is Joe Opaku, and it's a pleasure to be here. I am currently the Director of Public Policy for Lyft. I've been in this position for a little over a year and a half, 
And during that time, the position and uh, what it's entailed has definitely changed a lot. Back in 2013, when I first started, there was exactly one regulation on the books at the state level that regulated ride sharing. Last year, I think there were a total of eight bills that were introduced and only three that passed at the state level that would regulate ride sharing. And this year so far, we have seen about a total of 130 different bills introduced in 44 different states that specifically touch on the ride sharing industry. So uh, to your point, John, while it's only been a, a, a year and a half and it doesn't, it's definitely felt like a little bit longer. <laughs> um, prior to that, I used to work just down the road in San Jose. I was chief of staff for a council member, Ash Kalra, who is in the middle of his second term as a San Jose council member. I did that for about three and a half years, and I was remarking to John earlier that one of the last things that I was there to see was the official announcement of the opening of the PTO office uh, at San Jose City Hall. So in a lot of ways, I feel like I'm coming full circle being back here today. Uh, prior to that, I worked as an attorney in New York, uh, first as a prosecutor, um, as an assistant district attorney in Robert Morgenthau's office in Manhattan and then spent six years working in securities regulation for the New York Stock Exchange. So um, I think that my experience in regulation combined with my time uh, currently on Lyft allows me to kind of see both sides of the regulation entrepreneurship uh, debate. So I'm very pleased to be here and glad to contribute in any way I can. Thank you so much, Joe. And actually, you can just keep the microphone. <laughs> so, you know, I'm going to give some context to our next question for the audience. While the sharing economy is certainly <laughs> am I doing something? While the sharing economy is certainly creating jobs and making lives easier for millions of people, it also has pushback from obvious places such as the Taxi Commission for the Ride Sharing Sector, you know, where Lyft is, and, and from regulators such as the Attorney General uh, Schneiderman of New York as it relates to Airbnb. Right? But this week, Congressman Eric Swalwell from California's 15th district and Rep. Daryl Issa from California's 49th District, an unlikely pair came together to launch the Congressional Sharing Economy Caucus, and I saw that Lyft has become a member of that, the first of its kind. So tell us about the caucus. What kind of an impact do you think this caucus is gonna have for companies such as Lyft and Airbnb? And what are some concrete actions you would like to see coming out of that caucus? Sure, it's a great question, Shelley. And uh, yes, we are very thrilled to be part of the caucus, and we're very excited that Representative Swalwell and ISA took it upon themselves and crossed, uh, you know, crossed party lines to work together on this important issue. Um, before I get to the final, uh, the, the question that you asked, I think the most important thing about this caucus is not even necessarily the final outcome, but the ability and to have a, a forum for education, because. The one thing that I find um, on the industry side is that you are dealing with entities that are uh, trying to regulate something that they may not fundamentally understand, which obviously leads to significant problems. You had mentioned, Shelley, that um, you know, we have to deal with taxi commissions uh, in the ride-sharing industry. And as an example of that, the starting point for all the regulatory efforts that, uh, that were trying to be imposed on Lyft and on the ride-sharing sector all stemmed from taxi regulations, which, as a former regulator, I understand. If you have a new entity, the easiest thing to do is to try to find the current existing box that you can squeeze that entity or that product into. And if it looks like a, you know, if it sounds like a taxi, if it's transporting people, let's use existing taxi ordinances and impose that on the new industry. The problem is, is that unless you understand that industry, you will not recognize that that is going to destroy the industry. So that is why um, the efforts of uh, Swalwell and ISA are so important because before you can even get to any concrete outcomes, there has to be a level of education about what you're trying to regulate. And this is gonna provide the forum to do that, to have frank and open discussions, to build a body of knowledge and understanding about whether it's the ride-sharing industry, whether it's the room-sharing industry, what have you, this is the perfect place to actually build the level of understanding and the education about these industries. Because if you don't have that, there's no way to proper, properly try to regulate it. That being said, um, one concrete example that I would give uh, right off the top of my head um, would be the idea of extending commuter benefits to the ride-sharing field. Um, I think that the, all the rationale behind existing commuter benefits uh, are fully met by ride-sharing. We're taking cars off the road, we're reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So 
it seems to be an easy, uh, easy fit for the current uh, community mm -hmm. benefits that, that exist that we can extend to our, employee, our employees as employers. I think that is a great ask, and I would love to see that happen. So thank you for that detailed answer. Um, next, I'd like to go to Travis, uh, who's responsible for enforcing net neutrality rules, which basically ensure an equal internet for large and small companies. Travis, while millions of Americans want the new net neutrality rules, the new rules do have their share of detractors, just like the sharing economy in the form of powerful, te powerful telecom companies. Just this past week, AT&T and other opponents of the new regulations asked a federal court on Wednesday for a partial stay. What are some important steps that you would take to be ready for June 12th, the date of the enforcement, when the rules go into effect, and protect yourself from enforcement action or litigation? Sure. I think it probably helps to start by talking about what net neutrality means and what the FCC has done uh, to ensure a free and open internet in the last few months. Uh, there was a huge and robust debate uh, that involved you know, many in government, but also just many in the public about what needs to be done to ensure that the internet is free and open to everyone. And that's particularly important, not just to uh, consumers, but also to what we refer to in, in uh, DC as edge providers. But those are the companies that are over the top, that rely upon the internet for their business model. And in Silicon Valley, I'm willing to bet that that's virtually uh, every company here. Uh, but I'll go one step further and say that in the 21st century, um, virtually every business, no matter who you are, uh, uh, you have to have some kind of strategy for entering the digital economy. And ensuring that you have free and open access to the internet is critical to ensuring that we have a robust uh, and, and competitive uh, digital market. So what the uh, FCC did earlier this year was it adopted a strong, legally defensible um, rules to protect the internet. Uh, there's some bright line rules that are pretty clear that apply to broad mobile and fixed uh, broadband internet service providers. Uh, they are prohibited from blocking access to lawful websites and services. Uh, they are prohibited from slowing down uh, or, or, or throttling the, the, the speeds at which consumers or edge providers are getting access or are accessing the internet. They are prohibited from, um, from allowing paid prioritization to get a faster speed um, in accessing the internet. And they're also put in place certain transparency requirements, enhanced transparency requirements, to ensure that consumers and edge providers and companies that rely upon the internet get access to sufficient and accurate information about the network, the pipes that they're ultimately using. Uh, these rules are set to go into effect on June 12th, and as Shelley indicated, uh, there's no shortage of litigation and attempts to prevent them uh, from going into effect. We're confident at the FCC that uh, uh, they that they are sustainable that uh, they will go into effect on the 12th and we're preparing uh, on our end to make sure that uh, the rules and laws are being enforced uh, if I were a company right now thinking of in the valley or anywhere thinking about uh, what does net neutrality mean to me I'd first begin by familiarizing myself with the rules and sort of know I mean if you're a broadband internet service provider um, then you want to make sure you definitely know the rules but if you're any company that relies upon upon the internet, and in particular upon accessing customers and consumers all over the world. You want to make sure that there are not unjustifiable or unreasonable impediments to accessing those customers. And so being familiar with the rules and, your, and, and knowing uh, that the, the, the transparency requirements and what broadband providers are supposed to tell you about their networks is something that I would encourage everyone to do as we get ready to uh, ensure implementation of the open internet rules. Great, Travis, thank you. And I think that background, especially on net neutrality, really helped, although I know our audience is pretty savvy, so thank you. Actually, and next, uh, the question is for John. Um, I'd like to focus on a clear example of the government's, um, you know, their uh, impact in bringing, you know, and understanding the importance of innovation in Silicon Valley. Uh, Silicon Valley has long acted as the nation's, indeed the world's, top innovation incubator with one in eight registered patents originating from our region. And in the opening of the new USPTO office in Santa, in later on this year, it just highlights this fact further. As head of the office, John, tell our group about how in your role you plan to facilitate a more streamlined approach and outreach to the small business and startup community and to ensure that innovation continues to stay on course. 
Thank you, Shelley. And uh, you're right, you know, Silicon Valley is the most innovative region in the country, if not the world. And having a satellite office from the USPTO in the region just makes perfect sense. I've been a proponent of it for well over 15 years. And the fact that uh, playing such an active role now in opening up our Silicon Valley office, which will be in City Hall in downtown San Jose uh, later this fall, uh, we're just extremely excited to be able to bring the USPTO's services and programs out to the region. The Silicon Valley office will have three primary goals. Uh, one, as, as I mentioned, is bringing the USPTO's vast array of services to the Silicon Valley. And, and this includes how, we, how you interact with the USPTO. We'll have walk-in services, uh, but you'll also be able to, if the, right now we have 12,500 employees, 8,500 of them are patent examiners working all around the country. And through the Silicon Valley office, we can remotely connect you to them via state-of-the-art virtual interview rooms that mimic an in-person experience to help make that connection between the applicant and the patent examiner as robust as it can be. We'll be doing, we'll also have virtual help assistance. We'll provide one-on-one -on -one assistance for, for entrepreneurs and independent inventors. Uh, we'll, we'll also have a hearing room where the patent trial and appeal board will be able to administer their trial proceedings here in the Silicon Valley. And if the hearing happens to be taking place somewhere else, the, a party can actually use the hearing room to remotely connect to the hearing regardless of where in the country uh, it may be taking place. So we're really trying to step up the level of engagement with our community. Uh, the second goal is to serve as a hub of outreach and education for the community. The entire first floor of the, the, the fourth street wing in the city hall campus will be dedicated to outreach and education programming for the innovation community. We'll provide series of training programs, uh, not just for IP professionals, but for stakeholders at all levels, even from you know, K-12 and, and doing some programs related to STEM education and, and promoting STEM education in our schools, uh, to, to workshops with independent vendors and with startups and small businesses, to helping them understand that an IP strategy is an integral part of their business strategy and to understand the risks of, of, not, um, of, of not following a, a patent uh, application prior to disclosure and, and helping uh, stakeholders understand how the system is there to benefit them. Uh, and then just uh, lastly, the third goal is to help us attract, hire, and retain top quality talent to the USPTO uh, by hiring more patent examiners. We'll have about 80 patent examiners out of our space and more patent trial and appeal board judges uh, here from the region working on cases. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, you can just keep the microphone. I've, I have a question from the audience that I'm going to weave in, and it's uh -oh. relevant to you. So um, as a startup with limited resources and capital, how do you suggest that the startup community can get involved with policymakers to help shape future policy, and that might be John, you, and, and Travis, if you have an um, input on that as well. So uh, that's a great question, and not only will we be providing programs for the startup community, uh, but we also have a variety of services uh, for micro entities. The smallest of inventors get actually a 75% discount on our fees. There's a, also uh, pro bono programs and law school clinics that we help foster across the different regions in the country to help the under-resourced entrepreneur get started. And then there are also some low-cost options to help buy you time uh, to perfect the filing of your patent application. So all of those programs will be uh, you know, part of our education programming we'll offer through the Silicon Valley office, but also will be, and we have, uh, even just in the past year that I've been out in the Silicon Valley, we've held several small roundtable discussions, not just with me, but with other leaders at the USPTO from headquarters, meeting with startups, trying to understand exactly what the issues are and to help find ways to address those. Please. Yeah, I think it's an excellent question. Um, I've been uh, working in Silicon Valley and with a lot of people for years, um, most notably when I was in the California Attorney General's office, and I've seen the way that regulation of technology has changed dramatically in the last five to seven years. Uh, there was a time when 
folks did, when, when the Valley didn't want to engage with regulators, didn't want to engage with DC, wanted to be left alone. Uh, wanted to be left alone not just with DC, but Sacramento and all the other uh, uh, city and, and, and local and state uh, regulators around the country. And I think that's changing. What you heard from Joseph, what you're hearing um, from me, what you're hearing from, uh, from Shelley and from John, it, you're hearing that the government, whether it's at the state, local, or federal level, is paying attention. And so the question is, how do you get uh, to play a role in that process? And with, when you have little capital and when you don't have, uh, when you're trying to get your product or your service up and going, um, I would tell you to begin by engaging. At the bare minimum, begin to have that conversation. Go where you can see people and talk to them. But also think about organizing yourselves and folks like you uh, in the area. You know, you heard that from Joseph talking about how the sharing community is coming together. Even when your competitors, realizing that you can come together and have shared interest is something that I think a lot of what we'll call sort of the more legacy industries that are out there have done already. They all have associations in D.C. that are there representing their interests. And I think it's important to make sure that you are banding together, that you're engaging, and that you are being part of the conversation. That doesn't necessarily mean that you have to go file cases or anything like that, but it does mean that when there's an opportunity to comment, when there's an opportunity to uh, to, to write a letter to someone, that you should. And, and I would encourage you to embrace that because that is what really makes the democracy run. And I'll tell you that being in D.C., uh, you know, where, where I've now been for the last year and a half, I already feel disconnected from what's going on on the ground. The innovation is not taking place in D.C. The innovation is taking place outside of D.C. It's taking place here. And we have to make sure that whatever we're doing in D.C. is not unduly stifling that innovation. And so I highly encourage you to really reach out whenever you can and, and talk with uh, any of your regulators or the government folks that uh, you may deal with. Thank you, Travis. That was really great. And I love the passion behind the answer, too. So thank you for that. And it's also an issue that's really near and dear to my heart as well. How does the startup community stay engaged with government? And the next question is for Joe. Uh, Joe, um, you know, despite the limits that we just talked about from government regulators and competitors, um, the growth of the sharing economy has not been hindered. And But one limiting factor that has been talked about is customer safety. Uh, personally, as a user of Lyft and the occasional taxi, I do see a difference. I, I don't see a difference because either way, I'm getting a ride with a stranger, right, speaking for myself. Yet there is a real concern around customer safety as it relates to Lyft, Uber, and other ride-sharing economies, uh, companies. What steps are you at Lyft taking to ensure customer safety, and can you talk about your vetting process for your drivers? Sure, that's a great question, Shelley, and it's interesting. I want to, uh, one of the things you said in the question was that you don't see the difference between uh, driving with a taxi driver or a Lyft driver because either way you're driving with a stranger, but the funny thing is that very early in this process when you're we having discussions with legislators uh, I, I swear I had this comment at least 10 or 20 times where someone would say so you're telling me that I'm just gonna get into the car of somebody that I don't know and for some reason because you're accustomed to getting into a taxi and it, you don't think of the fact that you don't know the taxi driver but right. it's just the you know changing the viewpoint of how you look at the right. uh, look at that transaction so what we do at Lyft is we do a very comprehensive uh, nationwide background check. We uh, vet every single driver uh, at a nationwide level, and then we take it a little step, we take it a, actually a significant step further. Uh, for any jurisdiction that uh, this, the applicant has been uh, known to reside, we'll actually do a direct county search of those counties' criminal background records. And the reason that's important is because no matter how good a national database is for criminal background records, that database is relying upon the transmission of criminal disposition data from a locality to the national database. So there's always a chance for either delay or error in that transmission. So we want to make sure we're getting the most up-to-date information. So we'll go directly to the source and cut out the middleman, so to speak, to make sure that our information is most up-to-date. And that can cut both ways. That uh, By doing that, you can find a conviction that otherwise you would not have found. Or on the flip side, you can find that someone who was perhaps unjustly arrested actually had a case dropped. and. That, and that information had to been transmitted. Um, we also do a federal database background check, which is very rare in this industry. Uh, for those who don't know, federal crimes can often include such things as drug trafficking, kidnapping, and that's actually very rare in the transportation industry that federal databases are checked at a local level. Um, and then we check the sex offender database. 
Um, on the driver's side, we also look at the driving record and our standards are fairly simple. If you have three or more driving infractions in the past three years, you're not allowed to be a driver on the platform. Or if you've had one, what we call broadly a serious infraction in the past three years, that could be driving on a suspended license, that could be uh, reckless driving, things of those nature, you're not allowed to be a driver on the Lyft platform. So those are our standards up front and they're very strict. Uh, it actually weeds out a very high percentage of people who want to be Lyft drivers primarily because of the driving record. But the innovation in this is not just the thoroughness of our background checks, it's the transparency that we've brought to this industry. Because for those of you who are not familiar with the Lyft app, at the end of the ride, you have the ability to rate your driver on a scale of one to five. Every driver knows that if their ratings go below a certain level, which is about 4.5, they're at risk of being taken off the platform. So there's a very high level of incentive for drivers to be safe and to be courteous because they know that this is no, no longer an anonymous transaction. I grew up in New York City, spent most of my uh, adult life in New York City, and if I'm not trying to disparage the taxi industry, but if something happened, if I didn't have a pen and paper to write down a eight or nine digit license plate number or ID number, then there's really no recourse for me to do anything if anything happened on the ride. Here uh, on the Lyft platform, you're emailed with the driver's information. There's a record of what's going on. So there's a high level of transparency. And if there's an issue, you have the ability on your phone to report it immediately and we can respond to it immediately by just taking a driver off the platform while we investigate. And we can literally do that by a push of a button. So we think that this is well, another case of using innovation to actually enhance and increase safety and also to improve upon the customer experience. Great, thank you. And as you were talking, it occurred to me that, you know, you're talking about the Lyft platform, just a push of a button, increasing transparency. You know, there's this debate around, are you a, are, are you a technology company or a, a ride-sharing company? And I'd say you're a, a technology company. I don't, you know, so I definitely agree with that. We would agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So, um, next question, and I, I realize that we have a bit of a time limit, but, you know, this information is really valuable. Travis, this question is for you. Um, a different kind of security. Um, while millions of Americans, um, you know, there have been several bills that are introduced recently in Congress recently to establish national data security standards. I know that privacy and data security have been a big issue for the Enforcement Bureau, especially on your watch. So what can you tell us about possible data breach notification legislation and how it might relate to your work at the FCC? I, you know, I think that privacy, data security, cybersecurity are big issues not only at the FCC, but actually across uh, the country right now, not just for government regulators, but for businesses. Um, you know, when you see the sizes of the breaches, the data breaches we were seeing last year, you think Target or Home Depot um, and, and many of the banks, uh, it's not stopping. Um, it, there's a real concern, I think, among not only consumers uh, and businesses, but also government about what we're going to do to help prevent um, and respond to these breaches when they do occur. Um, you know, for years, uh, California has had the strongest protections on the books around privacy. Uh, you know, the right to privacy is in the California Constitution. Uh, California already requires data breach notification uh, whenever there's a breach involving more than 500 Californians, and that's true in 47 states. Uh, but the, each of those states has different rules and, on the books. And the question to Congress has been for some years now, how do we have one national standard? And there have been various bills introduced in the last year. Uh, there have been approximately four bills uh, introduced to uh, figure out you know, what data breach notification standards apply. And generally speaking, uh, they, they have two metrics to them. One is what triggers a data breach notification. Sometimes it's if it involves more than 10 thousand people, if it involves more than 1,000 people. Um, sometimes it's triggered by if there's a risk of identity theft or financial harm or injury uh, triggers the data breach notification. Uh, generally speaking, these laws would preempt um, state laws uh, that are contrary uh, to the federal law. Um, you know, in states like California, which have really strong laws, um, you know, I think that at least for state regulators and as someone that used to, to be in state government, there probably would be a concern about preempting stronger laws and replacing them 
with a federal law that might not be the same, uh, have the same levels. Uh, but there's, there's the, the last issue that tends to come up with them is there's certain areas or sectors that that have that, that uh, have information that is special and and is treated differently. Um, and we think of that usually as like health information or financial information, uh, communications information. That's where the FCC comes in. Uh, tends to be a, 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 have a lot of privacy rules and data security standards that are already on the books. And we want to make sure, at least from the FCC perspective, that those stay on the books. We already require data breach notification when a common carrier like your cell phone company has a, a breach involving a customer proprietary network information. Um, we'd want to make sure that those protections continue to be there and in place for American consumers. Thank you, Travis. Really appreciate that answer, and I, you know, I'm glad that you know it is on your watch. So thank you, and, and John. The last question is for you, and then I'll, I'll take a couple of audience uh, questions that have come in. And uh, John, um, can you talk about the modernization of government that's happening across the agencies, especially under President Obama's leadership, uh, where the government is bringing in there, they're taking a page out of Silicon Valley's book and bringing in top-notch tech talent to revamp websites and get rid of legacy tools and using more agile method development methodologies. My question is very specific to what you're doing at the PTO, which includes a critical new tool that the patent examiners are using to increase patent quality. Can you tell us about that? Sure. And, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, so it's called Patents End to End, and it's a program that's been taking place for a few years now, and, and we have adopted an agile methodology across the U.S. PTO, and that, as a federal entity, was an enormous transition for us, and, uh, and, and one we're very happy that we have taken. Uh, but with respect to the patents end to end, right now patent examiners need to use somewhere between 10 to 16 different tools to do their jobs just to examine one uh, application. And so we've been creating an integral platform for our patent examiners and have started rolling out uh, and integrating those uh, different components into this single platform and of course uh, while doing so enhancing the features so that examiners have um, much better access to prior art, uh, have better understanding of the claim structure and, and are able to now uh, actually search through uh, the actual patent application via text whereas before it was uh, only an image. So doing a lot of things on that front and then as we develop this platform un it'll provide for us an underlying platform that we'll make public for our applicants as well uh, through our, our, our public interface and ultimately also uh, uh, improving the public uh, uh, search system as well. And the last thing I just want to highlight is we've just two months ago rolled out our new web page as well. So we've been really trying to, to step up and keep up with uh, the advancements in technology, particularly in the searching area. So. Great, John, thank you. And I, I think we're going to be stepping off to the side, right? So if anyone has questions, they can come and talk to John, Travis, and Joe. I want to thank all three of you very much for your time today. It's been fantastic listening to you. Thank you. Thank you.